Uh, kia ora koutou. my name is Kelly Dix. I work at the New Zealand Fashion Museum. Uh, it's a museum that's a little bit different. Uh, we embrace the traditional purposes of a museum, uh, to build and take care of a collection, to develop social knowledge, and to encourage discussion about society, culture, and our national identity. But we don't have a building or a physical collection, and we're open 24 hours a day. Our home is our website. It's a place where you can search our collection, read our articles, visit our exhibitions, and buy our books. Our website is the place where we're able to fulfill our goal of recording and sharing New Zealand's fashion history. We tell the story of our website in three main ways, collection items, fashion stories, and exhibitions. Our collection items are garments or clothes, but not the actual clothes. We don't collect garments. There are plenty of museums who do a brilliant job of that, but we do take high-res photos of interesting and important garments and add them to our online collection. We photograph all the garments in our exhibitions, and we also set up pop-up photo studios where people bring along their, their own clothes and we photograph them and add them to the website. These are the types of photos that we add to our website. This is a six-piece suit owned by Sir Keith Holyoke. He wore it in the late 1970s when he was Governor General of New Zealand. It was made by three different tailors. Peter Bazala made the suit, H&J Green made the, tail, the waistcoat, sorry, and Acto Tailor Dresswear made the shirt. The outfit was part of our 2011 exhibition, Black and Fashion. This exhibition explored the New Zealand experience of wearing the colour black, including the adoption of the colour for our national sports teams. Where we can, we add original photos and stories to our garment entries. Sir Keith's daughter, Diane Coomer, remembers the mystique surrounding her father's formal wear. It was sent to a laundry in Wellington for cleaning, she recalls. It was a tiny frontage on Molesworth Street, opposite Parliament, where you, on entering the door, you had to open another door, and then there was a small hatch, which was just the size of the elderly man's face. The garments in our collection can be filtered in a kind of show-me way. Filtering by coats in 1960s shows more than 30 results, a visual snapshot of the coats made and worn in 1960s New Zealand. Our fashion stories are where we get to interview and research the people who have been involved in the New Zealand fashion industry. These are the stories of the designers, photographers, illustrators, models, media, manufacturers, retailers and events. At last count we had 178 fashion stories. The most popular story on our website is on an award show that ran from the 1960s to the 1980s. It was written by Cecily Gary, who has re recently written about some of our more novel fashion trends. Some of these fashion trends were well known international, internationally. The wasp waist and the full skirts of the 1950s, for example. But it's our own take on these trends that is so interesting, as this 1986 advertisement for the Auckland Jazzercise Centre shows. You don't have to be rich to be fit. The model wears a leotard by Moontide, who are still designing swimwear, but I'm not sure that they sell too many jazzercise leotards these days, despite the influx of active wear on our streets. Our garments and our stories have strong connections with our exhibitions. The first New Zealand Fashion Museum exhibition was in 2010, and seven years later we've curated 12 physical exhibitions. They've been hosted at different venues all around New Zealand, but it's an exhibition about Auckland fashion that I'll show you today. It's called Walk the Walk, A History of Fashion in the City. We wanted to explore the fashion industry from a geographical perspective. The people and the businesses who'd worked on worked in or were situated around central Auckland. Some of these people and businesses were still located in the city. 
Others had moved further out, and some had closed down half a century ago. We use the department store Smith & Coe's as our central point, researching the fashion-related locations and the streets surrounding the iconic store. For those of you unfamiliar with Auckland, the current Smith & Coe's building was built on the corner of Queen and Wellesley Streets in 1929. There are many high fashion retail stores located around Queen Street, but this area was once also a hub of garment manufacturing. If you walk the streets of central Auckland today, you can, if you use your imagination, still envisage the workrooms, the training schools, the salons, the department stores that had been, or in most cases, gone. This simple idea grew into a multi-stranded project. With the support of Auckland Council through its activation team, Walk the Walk was timed to be part of Heart of the City's Four Days of Fashion in the City Festival in March this year. The annual festival was a feast of fashion-related events and activities designed to promote the industry. We set about planning events that our audiences could be part of, live and interactive and on the street. We designed a program of three parts, an exhibition of vintage fashion garments that had been made in central Auckland or sold in central Auckland, a guide walking tour around the buildings where these garments were produced and sold, and a live catwalk show of the garments. In all our storytelling, we tried to link to our current fashion practices, and so we invited the current generation of creatives emerging from Auckland's fashion schools Garments from Whitecliffe, Fashion Tech, So Tech, and AUT made up the second part of the show, the heritage and then the contemporary. Each part was designed to celebrate and share Auckland City's fashion heritage and to engage the wide and diverse audiences from Auckland City. We made links between the past and the present. This is a Smith & Coe's fashion parade from August 1960. And almost six decades later, Smith & Coe's is still drawing crowds to their fashion shows. This show was organised by Smith & Coe's to showcase their fashion department. Here, the Australian model Andrea descends via the escalators before walking through the audience. So let's take a look at what we got up to in the 10 days of Walk the Walk, a history of fashion in the city. Twelve hundred people visited the exhibition during its 10-day run. It's an average of 20 per hour. We shared the garments and stories with fashion fans and also people who were just wandering past Elliott Street and wondered what the red carpet was about. Hundreds of people watched the two shows. And they shared their videos and their photos of the event on their social media accounts. The walking tours, led by the New Zealand Fashion Museum founder, Doris DuPont, quickly booked out. 
We added several more during the week. And then there were eight tours with more than 100 participants, plus an extra tour for a class of New Zealand fashion tech students that was led by their tutor. But as the world's first virtual fashion museum, digitising the exhibition was a priority. As a series of live events and a community-based exhibition, we had to think about the best way to do this. Developing an online exhibition provides an opportunity to think about the exhibition in a different way. The best online exhibitions take a layered approach, where a visitor can go deeper into information that is more extensive if they wish. We wanted to give our website visitors, most of whom didn't visit the physical events, a closer look. To do this, we took the three different parts of Walk the Walk and thought about how they would best work online. The starting point for Walk the Walk was a physical exhibition held at Smith & Co's department store on Queen Street and included more than 30 garments made within half a kilometre of the department store. The oldest garment was a black gown from the 1930s and the newest was a shocking pink ruffled ball dress by World. They included a dress bought from a market stall, a suit made to wear to the Benson & Hedges Awards and a cocktail dress for a 1980s soiree. We showcased the garments from the exhibition on our website using the same filter tool that we sorted 1960s coats to collate a, a permanent collection of photos of the garments on the display in the exhibition. It's possible to take a closer look at the garment online, just like in the physical exhibition. Website visitors could zoom in and examine details like the stitching or the print on this 1970s Susan Holmes dress. And if you have an eye for detail, you might also notice the hole in the second tier of the dress and want to read the story of how it got there. The exhibition was held in the Lippincott Room of Smith & Coe's on the sixth floor. The room has a long history as home of the Lyceum Club, a woman-only club established in the early 1920th century as a place to hold intellectual and cultural events for women. The room and its story intrigued visitors to the exhibition, and a social post about the club received a lot of interest on Facebook. It seemed to make sense to include this story on the online exhibition. We knew about the history of the Lippincott Room, but one unexpected theme of Walk the Walk was the women's stories that we discovered in our research. Another strength of the web is its ability to illustrate multiple perspectives and change over time. We were able to retell stories of grand department stores that were started by women in the late 19th century. A woman in the 1950s at leaving their children at home with their husbands while they ran businesses. And women who designed and made garments and an income while their children played at their feet. The catwalk show on Elliott Street was integral to Walk the Walk. We showed the garments online as they would have been worn and we posted short clips on social media. We made a slideshow of photos up from the catwalk show with links to the collection information if you wanted to find out more about a garment. The owner of this, Christine Dior Dress, Kathleen Cooper, recalls running into Gus Fisher at the races. Gus Fisher's business, LJ, held the exclusive New Zealand licence to manufacture Christine Dior. Kathleen recalls, Gus recognised the dress, looked her up and down and nodded his approval. And if you wanted to know more about Gus Fisher and LJ, we collated all the stories that we wrote to support the exhibition. And here he is, Gus Fisher on the right, shaking hands with Christine Dior in Paris in 1954. And you can watch a video of Gus Fisher talking about the events that led to the signing of the exclusive agreement. To, uh, for the purpose of selling their accessories and perfumes and so on, they wanted to get the name Dior around the world. So they asked him, if he could recommend anybody, and he recommended us, and arranged a meeting. So um, then they approached us to say, would we consider 
making their clothes under license. I always felt rather pleased about that because yeah, most people have always have approached Dior, but they actually came to us to see if we would represent them. And of course, something I was absolutely thrilled about. And Hello, did you know about this forgotten jewel? It looks like it was a Christian Dior boutique on Federal Street in Auckland. Well, it's on, it's on Kingston Street, actually. But for many Aucklanders and, and visitors to the street, the LJ Christian Dior sign has prompted curiosity and intrigue. We receive variations of this Facebook question on a regular basis. These kind of inquiries prompted us to think about offering walking tours. Walk the Walk provided the opportunity and a chance to test the concept. After spending many, many hours in the Auckland Central Library's post office, reading post office directories and walking the streets of Auckland CBD, we established 25 locations that had escaped the ravages of time and the demolition. We turned the 25 locations into 25 tour stops, some small unassuming buildings and some rather grand ones. In thinking about how to recreate the walking tours online, we realised it would be most powerful if we could get people to actually stand on the street when they were learning about these fashion locations. We worked with app developers MyTours to add the walking tour to the Walk Auckland app. Walk the Walk is one of more than 20 tours on Walk Auckland. There are tours of Point Chevalier bungalows, writers' walks in Devonport and Tap Takapuna, and an Auckland University heritage walk. We had a pretty good idea of which was the best way to walk after taking eight tour groups across busy streets, past city rail, tunnel, excavations and the usual city, Auckland City roadworks. The first version of the walking tour was 2.5 kilometres long and took just over an hour to walk. In September this year it was the Auckland Heritage Festival. Once again Doris led groups of fashion history fans through the streets of Auckland. We added 10 new stops to the walk including Ambler & Co, the stunning heritage building on Wellesley Street West, which was built in the 1920s by Fred Ambler to house his growing shirt factory. You can take the tour from anywhere in the world if you download the Walk Auckland app. And there's even a desktop version available, which meant that our writer Cecily in Dunedin, who doesn't own a mobile phone, was able to sit at her desk and take the tour. And we've just uploaded the audio to SoundCloud perfect for listening to on the train. We developed a lot of content dur during the Walk the Walk exhibition, which was invaluable when it came to putting it online. Text that were used for labels and for the exhibition reader was transformed into text to accompany photos of the garments and long form stories, audio in the app and on SoundCloud. And the, video and the visual media, the studio shots of the garments, the imagery we took on the street and found in our research. It added interest to the text and audio stories. It allowed us to create a layered online version of Walk the Walk. They provide an exciting opportunity to change or add content, increasing the geographical and the intellectual access to the original physical version. But this ability to constantly change and add new content means that we have to revisit our original brief. When we were choosing who to include in the exhibition, we were constrained by whether the building was still standing. We needed to visit it as part of the walking tour. But how do you deal with what we call the ghost buildings? The stories of the wonderful people in history whose buildings no longer exist. Do you bring them into the story where they belong? Is Annie Bonza, who designed this, the costume, she dressed the stars for the TV show Come On in the 1960s. The building where her boutique was located was demolished in the 1980s. And the Cook Street markets were demolished in 1985. This was where many of the current fashion designers found their feet, including Oscar-winning costume designer Nyla Dixon. They sold their designs from market stalls. Should this, be st this story be part of Walk the Walk Online? How do we accommodation, accommodate this kind of exhibition story that starts to develop a life of its own? We can redesign the exhibition template to accommodate new ways of storytelling. 
something that we're planning to do next year, but it seems our online exhibitions are an open-ended question. Our work on them is never done. They are, perhaps, an infinite game. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was really interesting. Um, are there any questions at all? No questions? I have a question for you, Kelly. Um, do you think that this kind of Walk the Walk tour could be done in other cities around New Zealand? I definitely. We're um, already thinking about um, K Road. K Road was a really big part of the Auckland fashion industry. And yeah, definitely um, any part, any sort of fashion district where there's a lot of the heritage buildings still remaining, we can, we can sort of transplant the, that kind of template. Thanks. Any other questions at all? Thank you. We'll just have a few moments between speakers.